So he, he's right. You know, when, when it's, it's all about the name. But it's faith in that name, like it says in Acts chapter 3, right? But um, when you get married, you can sit now, by the way. You can stand all day long if you want to. That's fine. Um, you, when you have that name, you get the name. So when you're married, I know this doesn't happen very often now, but it did. When you got married, you became Mrs. Such and Such. You were whatever you were, and now you've become this. And you take on the last name. Sometimes you even, you know, in times past, you took on the man's full name. You know, if his name was, you know, John Rogers or something, you, you were Mrs. John Rogers. Or sometimes you could be Mrs., you know, Joan Rogers or whatever the case may be, but you took on the name. It's exactly the same thing with Christ. You get to use his name because it was given to you. The Bible talks about, you know, coming into the family. You've been adopted into the family. So you have that family name. There is no better family name. You know, you think, you know, it, it, a lot of it in the States, or all over the place really, but in, but in the United States, you get really, you know, wealthy, prominent family names. And those people carry something about them because they're part of that family. Now, oftentimes they act like idiots, you know, oftentimes because they're just, you know, they have, they just think they can get away with whatever they want to get away with, right? So they act a certain way. Same thing with, with Christ. You have his name, so you should act a certain way because you're in the family. So you get to use his name. When you're signing a check or signing a name, you change your name on all your ID when you get married. And again, it doesn't happen very often because we've moved away from things that are good. You know? Now, when we... Um, several years ago, I'm not a... God speaks in dreams. But I'm not a guy that's, oh, this was a dream, and this was a vision, and I'm just in the vision of this, and I mean, all that's all. That can be real, but a lot of it's real hokey, right? But uh, God does speak to me in dreams quite often. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because there was a question, and I'll let Curry get to that and kind of stuff, but um, identity. Identity, we, we talk about identity, right? But it was identification with Christ. We've shortened it down to identity and, and, and almost stopped that part. You know, look at it, look what's happening in the world right now. There's never been a, I don't think, an, a bigger attack on identity. You can be what you want, how you want, when you want. You can be one minute this way and one minute the next way. That is not true. Okay, whatever you think you are in your soul, in your mind, wherever the devil has you believing, it's one way or the other. Simple as that. And this is why people need to be, you know, help to get through. It. And this is why the people need the word of God. So I, I had a dream. And again, I normally don't talk about dreams, but for whatever reason, this is maybe going to help somebody. Now, my wife and I were in a shopping area, and like an outdoor shopping mall kind of thing. And there was all these people walking around, fully clothed, nice clothed, um, you know, carrying bags and families, little kids, moms, dads, everybody was walking around doing their thing, and it looked normal. Everything looked normal, busy. And as I got closer to them, I realized that they, were, uh, they had no f facial features. They were like a mannequin. So with a mannequin, they have no eyes, they have a little bump for a nose, a little bump for ears, or whatever the case may be, but they have no, no definition. But why? Because they have no life. So everywhere we walked around, and I was, I was amazed, and looking, and, and there was just, just mannequins everywhere, but fully clothed, fully walking, living life, conducting life. And to everybody else, it was normal. But to, to me, it was, this, there's something wrong, we've got to fix something. I'm a fixer. You know, that's why I, I, I was in the line of work that, we were, that I was in because I, I wanted to help people. I wanted to fix things. I just maybe went about it the wrong way at times. But hey, at the end of the day, I was still trying to help people. Not the person that was laying on the ground, but the person, you know. Anyway, and um, I said, we got to fix this. So I was looking around for my wife, and I was like, where is she? Where is she? I, so I was starting to gather a group of people, and I'm like, where is she? Then I look over, and she's already got a group of people, and she looks at me and goes, you're always so slow. I was like, oh, Okay. So, so then I look over, and there's two big, two big buildings, and between them, the sun was shining down, like it shines down through buildings onto the ground. And I, we took our groups of people, and she was going through, and I was going through, and I tend to walk behind people all the time, because that way I can keep an eye on them, right? Just because I can't see what's behind me. So I walk behind people generally. Even when my wife's walking, she's, she's never walking behind me. She's either right here or half a step in front of me. When we're walking through New Orleans, I was telling you on Sunday, uh, I said, walk a step in ahead of me. She's like, well, I don't want to walk a step ahead of you. I want to walk beside you. I'm like, yeah, but I can't really see just in case, right? 
So she was ahead of me and we were walking. So I was walking with this last person. I think it was a, a younger lady. And we're walking through. And as the sun hit her on her feet, and it, it started, you know, when you're walking into the sun, it, it, it kind of shines on you. I could hear heaven singing. And I said to her, I said, can you hear that? The angels are singing over you. And, and then she started to get definitions, ear holes, eye, you know, things like that. Started, she started to get defined. And I realized at that time, and I didn't know what it was because it was years before I met Curry and knew anything about this. But now I realize that we were bringing him into the light, to the truth, and they were gaining their identity because they were getting life. So this is why I'm so driven for this. And this is all stuff that was leading up to getting this truth in me. So I think God was just, you know, keeping me on the line sort of thing so I didn't give up completely um, because he knew what was coming. I just didn't know what was coming, you know. And so this is, this is why, because we're trying to get people to learn how to identify with Christ because Christ lives in them. And this is why I'm so passionate about this, okay. Now, we're gonna, I said I'll let Curry answer the questions. I am, but one of them has to do with what I'm talking about. So he's got a pile of them back there. Um, so this just be, basically says, please um, clarify physical, I think it says something or other, generational curses um, when born again. So the sins of the father shall not pass to the sons and all that. We're going to do that. So we're going to get to that. But this one says, when it, was, uh, when it was said, greater works will you do, does that mean greater works as an individual or greater works as a group? And we're going to quickly go to John 14, 12. And this will clear that up right away. This is why I wanted to get to the question because it's super fast and easy. Okay? So John 14, 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you, he that believes, not they, he that believes on me, uh, the works that I do shall he do greater works, and he shall he do because I go to my Father. Okay? So he is individual. It's not a group. So a lot of people think that, you know, a, a collectively as a group, you'll do one thing, and you do one thing, and you do one thing, and, and then we all come. That is not true. It says he that believes on me. It's personalized. See, the other way we can say, well, you know, we came together as a group, and you guys weren't believing. I was believing, but you, I mean, come on. What's wrong with you guys? No, it's he. It's personal. Because he's personal to you. You're an individual in him, part of a body. Just like you're an individual in a family, but part of a family. So it's, it's you individually, he that believes on me will do these works and greater works. And people think that's blasphemy. No, it's written in red. Jesus said that, that you will do greater works than I did because I go to my Father. That's amazing. And people get hung up on, well, you know, it's not all about works. You know, you're right, it's not about works, it's about relationship. But we don't do works for salvation, we do them because of salvation. You don't have to do them, you get to do them. And if, you're, if you don't want to help people... I don't know how much of the love of Christ is in you and operating in you. So like I talked about on Sunday, it's that working power that's in you, not just the power that is in you, residing in you. It's that power that's working through you. That's what makes the difference. So how much power is working through you? Unfortunately, for most Christians, it's like next to nothing. Why? Because I was one of those. See, I can say it because I was there. This, is, this whole thing is my testimony, and you can't, you can't take that away from me because it's mine. I own it, Right? And that's unfortunately how we live. Because we get busy with day-to-day -day activities, get busy with this, get busy with that. Change your focus. Put your focus on Christ. The Bible says that he will keep you in perfect, he will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. So if you're not in perfect peace, it's because your mind isn't stayed upon him. This is all I think about. If my wife was in the room, I think she's helping the book table, she can tell you that I often miss turns. One time in Manzanillo, in that video, I almost drove into the ocean. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm seriously, because I'm constantly thinking about this. And I'm daydreaming. I probably shouldn't even drive. I'm, 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 I'm daydreaming about how to get this message out, how to get the truth out, how to set people free, how to see the, the miracles of, I was talking to somebody a little while ago about somebody's you know, leg growing out. I mean, not even talking, I've seen people's legs grow out, and most of the time that's when people do it, it's hokey pokey. But I'm talking like somebody who had no leg, somebody who has no arm, grow out. Curry actually has seen, he prayed for somebody one time and he said, you know, to mark up their arm or something and they kept doing that. And during sitting in school, he could tell the story way better than I can, but he, 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 this girl would sit in school and she could hear crackling, popping and things and it was her arm growing little bit by little bit. And there's actually a testimony about it on YouTube I've seen. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. This is real. Yes. And th this is why we have to get Christians on this because we're going to change the world. Anyway, Amen. I said we're going to get into generational curses and we are... 
focus. Okay. There's so much, you know, because before, before my dad passed, before we even knew about JGLM at all, we were on our way to another conference. We were conference junkies, okay? Now, do I like conferences? I'm at one now. We go around the world teaching conferences, but it's about the right stuff. I was chasing man, chasing anointing, chasing power. Chasing, if I could just get them to lay their hands on me, my life will be changed. And we left every single time angry and hurt because nothing changed. Why? Because we were seeking what man had, yet we had it in us the whole time. How much money I could have saved? You know? Um, but so, so conferences are obviously good, but it's got to be for the right reasons. But we, we, we chased all these things down. And just before we went to another big name conference, God said, get the word in you. And I was like, I guess God wants me to read the Bible because at that point in time, I wasn't really reading the Bible that much because I couldn't understand it. The Bible is so simple to understand. It's, it's amazing. I, before it was so, when, when you're in religion, it's so complicated. There's, there's no way that you can understand it. But when you look at it through, I look at the Bible now as not trying to get. I, I read it from a position of already having. This is who I am. I'm not seeking it. I have it. Now how do I get it out of me? But God said, get the word in you. And I thought he meant just start reading scripture again, you know, or more. So I started reading the Bible more. It's not what he meant. Now I know what he means because a couple of months after that, when my dad, stepdad passed away in Mexico, I knew what it, what it means to get the word in you, to literally eat this word, to get it in you. So that's all that comes out of you. And like I said on Sunday, you know, when we started getting into this, and even now my kids are like, dad, can't you talk about anything else? No, I can't. I, I really can't. You know, I used to be into race cars and had all that, and that's all I talked about was race cars and constantly on eBay and all these different places, you know, buying new turbos and motor parts and spending tens of thousands of dollars on things, and a lot of times we didn't even have the money, but, you know, you got a credit card, so, you know, we need that car part, whatever, and um, changed all that too. Sold all the race car stuff um, because this is all I think about. I didn't have time to think about that. You know, and I didn't want that to become, like I was saying yesterday, I didn't want that to become a hindrance to me. So I sold it on my own volition because I didn't want it to slow me down. I didn't want to be here thinking about, oh, next weekend I'm going to go race cars. No, I'm here thinking in two days from now we're going to be teaching a new man's seminar in Edmonton, Alberta. And then we're going to leave and come down and meet Curry and he's going to teach a new man's seminar. Why? Because we've got to get this word out. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, as they say. And we've got to change it. Just look at this, what's going on with this virus thing. Hokey Dinah, the whole world's got a shortage of toilet paper. I don't want to get too graphic, but if you have no food to eat, they're not buying food. They're not, be, they're not buying the basics of what they need for, for life. They're buying it out of fear. I was talking to somebody in Australia last night, and the same things happened there. And they're, everybody's going around buying toilet paper. And they asked them, Why are you doing that? Because uh, everybody else is. It's fear. So never live by fear. You don't have to live by fear. But everybody's, if you needed toilet paper and you served a God of heaven, he gave manna. <laughs> Just saying. But we serve the world. And Christians are jumping. These are Christian, a lot of these are Christian people. I watched a video. It, it, I didn't really watch it. it. It came up and I saw it. And it was three women beating the tar out of each other in a Walmart over toilet paper. I mean, full on, like... What? What do you, what do you, what do you, it's just fear. We don't have to live by fear, you know? So anyway, section 14, page 123. Sure you found it by now. We've only been trying for about an hour. Okay. Numbers 23, 8. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Okay. Or how shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? So I'll just let that sink in and we'll move on. Exodus 20, 3 through 6. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me, which proves, like Curry was teaching yesterday, that you can have a god. There's, you can have so many other gods. Anything can become a god in your life. Anything. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the, of, uh, the fathers upon the children of the third generation, or fourth generation. Stop. This is where people stop. 
Most of you didn't stop. Most of you read on, so that's okay. But you stop there. And it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Stop. This is where people get generational curse teaching from. And they get up there and they preach this. And they say, you see, God's visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation. You're all doomed unless you come and see me, the super duper anointed chain breaker. For 1995, I get you free. That's a cheap deal, by the way, because Curry was talking about a guy charging $5,000, and I know who that is. And it was, it was addressed. When we were teaching a DHT in Calgary last March, I got onto this, and I really went after people charging money to get people free. Had no reason to do it. It was just coming out of me, and I was really blasting this thing. And uh, it was a fairly large church that we were in, and off to my right a little bit, uh, in the middle section, because there was a section section in the middle section, these two young guys were always talking to one another. And I thought, boy, I'm really making them mad, or they're really agreeing with me. Either way, I'm good, because I know it's true. And they kept doing it, and kept doing it, and I was, then I was thinking, wow, these, these guys just aren't, they're not shutting up, you know? And so we went through this whole thing and I taught it and I really went after how, how people are doing it and charging money and you, know, you, you, you buy anointed water off TV or you buy this or you buy that. It's all a gimmick. It's all snake oil, right? It's all fake for them to buy another big boat or another fancy car or something on, on, on your dime, okay? Um, now, do, do prayer cloths, and as we call them prayer cloths, things like that work? Yeah, but not really when you're buying them, you know? And uh, so I kept going on this thing. And then after the conference, dur during our healing line, they came up and they said, I want to let you know why we were doing that. I said, okay, well, what's that? He said, well, you kept going after this and hitting on this. I said, yeah. He said, we just went through that. And we just paid money to get free. And the people sitting next to us in the role we were sitting are the people that charge us money. So that's why the Spirit of God was hitting that, because they were charged the money. And the people sitting next to them, four people, were charging them money. And I found out afterwards, well, then, at that time, that church had saved up $90,000 for renovations off getting people free from a lie. You are free from the lie, in the, in the, you know, and in the spirit, I'm talking. 90 grand. $90,000. Then we went up to Edmonton to teach another DHT shortly after that. And while we're there, this gentleman sitting over to my right, he was angry. But he wasn't angry at me. He was angry because he paid a very well-known demon deliverer freedom guy $2,200 to get free, to buy all his materials and manuals to get, and he wasn't free. But he was after our ministry time. I said, man, I hope you got a receipt. You know? If I charged you $1,000, it would be a bargain compared to that. We charge nothing. As a matter of fact, when we go to conferences, we said it. You know, somebody was there. We, were, we, we never really talk about money, but the topic of money came up because that, in that particular congregation, this is where we had to go. Everywhere you go, God, there's different people that need to hear different things, right? So I started talking about money, and I looked at our team. And I said, today we are not receiving an offering whatsoever because I'm talking about money, and I don't want to pull on money, so we're not taking an offering today. And I said, as a matter of fact, if you need money, come and see us, and we'll sow into you. People came and said, hey, listen, I came to hear you, and I'm sleeping in my car. I drove, I think, the equivalent of like 1,200 miles or something to come and listen to you. That's huge. And thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. Anyway, and uh, he said, and I have no food to eat. But it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll go without food for the next three or four days. Um, but I have no food to eat. And you made the offer. Um, and I said, okay, well, how much do you need? So he told us, and we gave him twice as much. So we didn't take an offering. We gave him twice as much. You know? That's what honor is, you know? But it's not, it's not charging people money. Jesus never did that. Amen. The gospel is 100% free. Now, does it cost money to travel? Of course it does. That's, what, that's why we, we receive offerings. If you, if you want to, great. If you don't, that's fine too, because God's our source, yeah. right? But these people charge money all the time, and they lie to you, and they, and they, they bring you in, and they say, well, you got a generational curse, so we got to... I mean, Curry touched on it yesterday with Sozo and Theophostics and stuff. we got to go back through your lineage. we got to take you back to when you were you know, 12 years old or so, whatever it is, and you, you find out where this is happening to you, and you know, where's Jesus in the room and all this other kind of stuff. It's not scriptural. You're, it's, it's psychology. And you're only dealing with the mind. 
And what you, generally what you end up doing is bringing back the hurts and the pains that some people might have forgot about. So you're giving people a shovel to dig up the dead body that died with Jesus Christ because you were buried with him in death and, and raised with him in resurrection. And that's what happens. You're just, you're just digging. And every time you go in there and say, sir, I'll, let me take you back to when you were this, this, that, and the other thing, and, and you bring it back, and you bring it back the hurts and the pains and the memories. You can't do that. Now, I'm not saying that you can't you know, come and say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting over this. Could you pray for me? I'm not saying that. But it's, it's, hey, you're free from this in Jesus' name. He's made you free. He's made you accepted in the beloved. Amen. See, once you, once you realize the Bible actually says you've been made free, and you've been made accepted in the beloved, rejection should just completely fall off. Yes, that's right. Because the king of glory accepted you. That's right. You didn't even earn it. He made you accepted in the beloved. Come on. And I was a guy who dealt with rejection. This is why I did some of the things I did, because... It, people feared me, and I liked it, because I had control, you know? I never set out to hurt anybody, never did, in, in, in the sense I was, like if I was defending somebody, I, you'd have to do what you need to do. I mean, police officers do, do the same thing, right? I worked alongside the, the police. So we did, we did what we had to do, but never set out to hurt anybody, but I sure set out to make people fear me. I didn't even drink. I've never been a drinker. I've, I've, I've never had any kind of an addiction problem or anything like that. Um, but when we would go to certain, you know, if we went to play pool or something like that, I play pool once in a while or whatever, never was really that good at it, but we'd go to certain places and we'd be in a bar or, you know, pub or something of that nature. And someone, this was years ago, this was 30 years ago, and people would come by and they would have like a, a tray full of alcoholic drinks. And I guess it was cheap drink night or something, I don't know. And I would look at these people, I didn't even know them, and I'd say, how many of those are for me? And he'd say, sir, you can take as many as you want. I didn't even drink, but I wanted that intimidation, you know? And, and so did I suffer from reje rejection? Sure I did, because I grew up feeling rejected by my dad. Now, my dad and I have an awesome relationship for, since I've been a Christian because I set it out. I didn't want to be, I, I grew up in a home not, not ever saying that, you know, anybody loved me or anything like that. My dad, I can remember one time that he told me he loved me. And I knew he loved me. My parents weren't mean to me. They just, they just couldn't say, I love you, right? And my mom was divorcing my dad, and my dad took his cowboy boots off one night and threw them against the wall. He was drunk, and he said, son, I love you. I was 12 years old. It's the only time I can remember till now. And, and about 20 years ago, I decided I'm a Christian. I'm a new man in Christ with, with the limited knowledge that I had. I've got to forgive my dad because he's the one that I'm holding this stuff against. And it's not affecting him because he probably doesn't even know. It's affecting me. Yes. And I, want, I was angry at him, you know. And um, someone asked me one time, they said, if, if, you know, we were talking about my dad. Where he said, if your dad came in the room right now, what would you do? I said, I'd probably punch him in the face. I'm just being honest. Because at that point in time, we were going through this whole soulish thing. And I didn't realize that we needed, at that time, I thought that's what you had to do for inner healing. I didn't realize at that time I was inner healed. So instead of living in the inner healing that was already taken place by the Spirit of God, I was trying to get inner healed in my mind instead of living by the Spirit. And so he's bringing up all this stuff about, you know, feeling rejected and all this other kind Of course I feel mad. You know, who's, who's happy discovering the pain that's in their life? Nobody gets happy about that stuff. But I realized at that point in time, I got to forgive my dad for me. So I set out to have a relationship with my father. And I started hugging him and holding his hand. My dad was a big, scary dude. He fists like lunch boxes and big beard, and they called him Grizzly. He's tough as nails. My whole family, I was just saying it to somebody. I think it was to you. I think I was saying it to you. My family's tough as nails. You know, my whole family's tough. We, we grew up like this. My, my aunt was the, one of our provinces, BC. She was the interior BC's women arm, arm wrestling champion. Right? Just, just, just tough as nails. My mom used to beat up her, her brother's enemies, her older brother's enemies. My mom. You know? So anyway, this is, this, is, this is how we grew up, you know? But I learned how to forgive my dad. And I needed to walk that out. And I set out to have this relationship with him. And now all the time, I love you, dad. He's, love you, son. Hold his hand, hug him, kiss him on the bald head, you know, whatever. And he told me several years ago, he said, you know what? You're a better father and a son than I ever was. 
and, and, you know, inside I'm crying and outside I'm like, yeah, you're right, I am. You know? <laughs> you know, he's a good man, but he didn't grow up with that. You know, you see? So this is where people get generational curse stuff from is because they, they, they see this happen, they have this pattern in their family, and then they perpetuate it, and it keeps going, 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 going. It's a generational curse. No, it's not. It's a generational choice. See, if your dad was an alcoholic and you become an alcoholic, it's not a curse, it's a choice. So we should call it generational sin because it's a choice. You hear it all the time. Well, you know, I'm probably going to get pregnant at 18 because my mom was pregnant at 18. Or I got pregnant at 18. My mom got pregnant at 18. I guess it's God's will or, or something of that nature or it's a generational curse. No, it's not. It's a generational choice. So generational curses do not exist for a Christian. Period. And we're going to show that out. We're going we're to prove it in Scripture. This isn't the book of Marty's opinion. This is Scripture. Okay, we're going to pull it apart. When you believe that, it puts you in bondage, possibly forever. So all the generational curse teaching, all that stuff is complete and utter rubbish. All of it. Because it's completely anti-scriptural. And I don't care if you teach it, I don't care if you paid for it, and I don't care if you get paid for it. It's wrong. And you will stand before Jesus Christ, and he will say, you went against my word. So like I said on Sunday, if you say anything in this book, if you say healing passed away, if you say generational curses, this is my opinion. I think generational curse. Your opinion doesn't matter because you're denying Christ. Because you're denying the word, and he is the word made flesh. So you're denying Christ by teaching this stuff. It's amazing. And I don't care what somebody's taught you. It's what scripture says. Like Curry said yesterday, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven, period. Now, let's look at what, we'll finish off what we said here. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Do you hate them? Then it wouldn't matter to you anyway, even if it was real. Does it, does it not say that? Okay. Now, verse six, this is who God is. And showing mercy unto thousands. Thousands of what? People? Or generations? Showing thou unto them, because we're talking about generations. We're not talking, it doesn't say third and, fourth, uh, third and fourth people. It says generations. And I will show mercy unto thousands of them. Generations. Thousands of generations of them that love me and keep my commandments. Pretty plain, right? We were in a church service one time, and this lady, this, this lady comes up for prayer, and I heard this, this one deacon lady, actually she's a pastor's wife now, standing there talking and praying off all these generational curses. I was trying to be nice, you know, so I, I let her do that, and then I took this woman aside, and I said, listen, this is all false. Give her the scriptures. I said, if anybody ever starts breaking off a generational curse from me, run. It's garbage, every bit of it. We were at a church service the other day, and this lady comes up. She said, I think the Lord wants me to pray for you. Okay. I used to be like, oh, yes, give me a word. Oh, give me, because I needed direction. Now they're like, can I pray for you? Sure. Will you accept the word I'm going to give you? No. Tell me the word, then I'll decide. Because I'm not going to allow this, because I don't know what, what's good or bad that's going to come out of your mouth. I'm not going to accept it. Amen. So she started talking, blah, 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 about all stuff, whatever, and you know, all this stuff. And then she starts getting into soul ties. And, and, you know, you have such a poor image of yourself and all the stuff. And that is absolutely not true. And she's like, you know, when you look in the mirror, you're so hard on yourself. And you, you say, why, why me, Lord? Uh, come on, man. The pity party's been over for years. So the devil's trying to put this stuff back on me, right? And I'm, I'm trying to be nice. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to be rude. Um, so I let her, whatever, and she did her thing. And then she starts talking about curses, generational curses and soul ties and things like that. And then she stopped. And she said, what do you think about that? I said, I think you're wrong. Because it's anti-biblical or anti-scriptural. This isn't true. None of this is true. Shut her down real quick. I will not accept it. and will not have any of... Usually that would come on and say, oh, I guess I am a hermit. Oh, and then you get into a pity party. Now I know who I am. I've never been more confident in my entire life. And it's not arrogance. It's confidence. Confident in the word. So when somebody gives you some rubbish, where does, where does garbage go? In the garbage bin. Not the person. She was trying. I understand. I'm not angry at her. She was trying to do what she was doing. She was stepping out and stuff. But it was wrong because it's not scriptural. And I live by this stuff. So to them that keep my commandments. Now, Exodus 34. 
you can see, um, we'll just go down to the verse 7 here for the sake of time. Um, keeping mercy for thousands. Okay, well, let's read 6 because it's good. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant, and, and abundant in goodness and truth. Where's this mean God we serve? Keeping mercy for thousands, generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty. Well, you see, God can't clear the guilty. You're not the guilty, you're the redeemed. We're not, you were guilty. You were a sinner. See, here's another thing that I used to believe. Well, you know, we're all just sinners. We'll always just be sinners. I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner saved by grace. After you become saved, the Bible does not call you a sinner anymore. It calls you a saint. That changes things. Because every single day, you don't wake up, oh, I'm just a sinner. Oh, you know me, Lord, forgive me. I picked up a hitchhiker not that long ago, driving down the road, and I was talking about Jesus. And he said, you know, I know Jesus. Every day, I, conf- I, I, uh, um, what is I confess my sins at least 2,000 times a day. Dude, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you do? What do, you do? What do you, same with the, 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 the guy in, in Scripture that, that had 2,000 demons. When Jesus came up and he came over, he had at least 2,000 demons. They called him, he said that we, we are a legion for we are many. A legion can have up to, it's an old military term, it can have up to 6,000 people in this. So he had, they say two because 2,000 pigs, all that kind of stuff, right? So let's say two. What did he do to get like 2,000 demons? But yet God set him free just like that. So I picked this man up and he said, yeah, at least 2,000 times a day I, I confess my faults. There is no way you're messing up 2,000 times a day. <laughs> It, it, you wouldn't have time for anything else. You just mess up all day long. But that's what he believed because it's just it's just guilt. Religion and and people's view of Christianity is guilt. But you're not the guilty, you're the redeemed. So I started believing that. And that's what started to change. Because the truth got to mean you shall know the and the truth so. But if you don't know the truth, you can't be free. So you can't just have the truth of he's your savior. Because that's not going to save you free or set you free. You need the whole truth because you can have partial freedom. But you need full freedom. You need full truth. And the truth is, I'm a saint. Now, sometimes you can be a saint who sins, but you're not a sinner. You were a sinner. While we were still sinners, God sent his son. While you were, past tense. Read Romans 6. How he set you free. He's made you free from sin. You're a saint. Now stop sinning. You're a saint, so act like it. But you're not the guilty. Where were we? Visiting. Clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, grace in the Old Testament. Amazing. O Lord, let uh, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Now, that's what he's saying. Just go. And there's another part of Scripture where Moses went to God and said, Hey, listen, pardon us. And the very next Scripture, God said, Okay, you're pardoned. Forgiven. That's how fast forgiveness is. That fast. When we you know, put ourselves in sackcloth and throw ashes on ourselves and call all our friends and feel guilty and have a pity party, it's that fast. If you mess up... It's that fast. He is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's, it's we that hang on to that, and your friends and your family and stuff. You know, I have friends that we've given up for, for years, and they're, they're mad at me, and I don't care, whatever. And you know, you're, not, you're not the guy you used to be. Yeah, you're right, I'm not. And I'm proud of it, too. And they want to get together. Do you remember when we were 15? Man, I'm 49 years old. You know, or do you remember the glory days? I was broke and lived in my parents' basement. How was that the glory days? <laughs> I get to travel the world and set people free. These are the glory days. Just because you ain't living them don't mean I'm not. These are the glory days. I'm having more fun in my life now than I ever have. But they just want to get together. Do that. So I can't be with them. I don't care what I did when I was a teenager. You know, when you get to go, let's reminisce. No, I don't want to reminisce. Unless reminiscing is yesterday when Curry was teaching and we learned some stuff and we saw some, you know, the lady with the knee issue. Was it, was it, was it yeah, was it you? Okay. Yeah, so that's, that, let's want to reminisce about that? Sure. Amen. But not when I was 16 years old. 
Well, reminisce about the truth of the Word of God. See, when you're busy doing that stuff, you can't be busy doing this stuff. When you live in the past, you'll forever be waited. When you're in the past, you can't be in the future. Because your past has nothing to do with your future. It's done. Stop creating a new past. That's the problem. See, people have a past, and that's fine. If you have a past, no issues. It's good. It's buried. But most people are creating a new past today for tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So your past is 20 years ago, you've been forgiven. But you're doing stuff today that you'll need tomorrow to be forgiven for today. And you're creating a new past. Have a past and leave it there. Leave it dead and buried. Don't bring it up. Numbers 14, 16 through 24. Verse 17, next page, page 124. We'll go right down to verse 17. And now I beseech you, because I really want to get to Ezekiel 18. Because the Lord was not able to bring his people into the land which he swore by them. Verse 17, I want to start there. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and no, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and uh, third and fourth generation. So what happens here is people just keep pulling this out of Scripture. Okay? And, and they don't go to anywhere else. I don't know how they, they get past this next part. Verse 19 says, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according to their, the greatness of your mercy, and as thou hast given these people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. That fast. According to your word. Moses said, hey, listen. Forgive these people, man. They're a bunch of... They're not so smart sometimes. Forgive them. And God was like, well, you know, let me think about it. And, you know, I'll get together with the Son and the Holy Ghost and we'll, we'll, you know, see what we want to do. No, right away he said, okay, no problem. According to your word, they're forgiven. Done. It's that fast. Forgiveness is that fast. Now, that doesn't mean we can sin and then have forgiveness and sin and have forgiveness and have sin. Then the love of the Father is not really in you. I have pardoned it according to thy word. Now, if you look down here, uh, Deuteronomy... Um, it basically says the same thing, but verse 9, the last part of it says, Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercies unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So again, that's where people camp. That's where they build it. That's where they stay upon it. And you look at it, you take it out of, out of context, and then you say, wow, it is scriptural. And then you get into this whole thing. I met a lady one time, nine months, every Wednesday night, at 90 bucks a session or something like that, she went in uh, to, to get free of these curses. For nine months, how many do you have? None, because you're in Christ. That's the truth. Nine months, hour and a half, and they literally sit there and they say, tell me about your life from your earliest memories on, and she's probably 60 years old. That's a long time. No wonder it took nine months. Don't tell me anything. Tell me you need help, and I'll get you free in 30 seconds. How about that? And if you need money, I'll give you some. That's how it should be. But the, all this other stuff of coming in and getting, I mean, it's just getting rich. The Curry was telling this one, talking about this one guy yesterday. $5,000 this one woman paid. I was there. She came to me and told me the story. And, and we said some stuff. And if somebody's charging you that, they're a devil. If someone is doing that, they're an absolutely a devil. We didn't realize that the man was sitting in the conference. But anyway... <laughs> Truth is, truth is truth. Any way you look at it, truth is truth. That's right. So this lady came to us and she told this, and I was mad. I was really mad because that is wrong. Not only am I putting you in bondage, I may be putting you in financial bondage. So we took her out in the hallway and prayed for her. And God did a work in her. She was stiff as a board, um, almost unresponsive with what God was doing in her, and the devils were coming on, all kind of stuff. And we weren't really supposed to be back in this hallway because that's where the, it's where the um, employees of this convention center we were at were going and they're trying to wheel their carts in and out and stuff we got this lady all whatever in this area and and they were going to call the ambulance or police or something no no she's fine she's good she's fine so we had to get her out of there because they couldn't get by so we're a couple of us are picking her up and she's dragging her feet and they're all contorted and we're, we're trying to bring her into the thing and of course we're in the meeting when everybody's looking at her and stuff like that that was the that, that was the lady who, who paid five thousand dollars and, he go, and she goes and sees him every year. 
Well, if I told you, hey, listen, I'll get you free, but you got, I could stay free. You got to come and see me, pay me $5,000 a year, and I'll get you free. And you believe that. I got you in hook, line, and sinker. And we were talking about it. If you had two of those people per month, you're making 10 grand a month and don't have to do a blessed thing. Wow. Except lie to people. Wow. It's a good gig if you're on that side of things. We got her free. We got a testimony a little while later. She's, she's totally free. And it costs this much money. It's amazing. So we're going to try to finish this up here. I don't even know what time we're supposed to break at again, but sure, why not? I'm just going. Whatever. Just look at me and say, that's enough, and then we'll be good. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 18. If anybody says to you, you have a generational curse, or I think I have a generational curse, bring them here. Okay? Really simple. Ezekiel 18 verse 1 says, The word of God, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So Ezekiel was what? Prophet. What's a prophet? Spokesperson for God. Right? So we know he's speaking to God, for God. Because God said, it says here, the word of the Lord came unto me. So God is saying. And what was he saying? This is what God said. What do you mean? So why, why, what are you doing? What are you saying this for? That you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That's scripture. You see that? That, that is written in the Bible. That's not, that's not you know, making anything up, okay? I hate when you open brand new bottles. They sell these ones so full. Okay. This gets really good. Why are you saying that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? What's he saying? Why are you saying that the children are responsible for what the father does? All you need is that one line and generational curses is completely destroyed. But the good news is there's a whole bunch more. As I live, is God still living? Yes. Okay. So this is still real, right? Okay. Because God's word is forever settled in heaven. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Don't say it anymore. Shut your mouths. Don't say this anymore, period. So anybody who teaches this stuff is going against scripture. Going against what God said. Because God said, don't do this. They're denying the word. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so is uh, so the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. You notice this doesn't say your spirit? Because your spirit can't sin. Like if you're, if you're born again Christian, you can't sin. You're, there's never a problem with your spirit. You don't have an angry spirit. I mean, you can have your spirit can get stirred up inside you, but I'm saying your spirit doesn't sin. There's no problem with your spirit. The problem is in your soul. So the soul that sins, it shall die. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and so this is going to give a list of this righteous man, a good man, that does a, stuff, a bunch of stuff that is lawful and right. So it's going to give you a recipe of the good stuff he does, okay? And has not eaten upon the mountains, neither has lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither has defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has he come to a menstruous woman, and has, has not oppressed any. Why? Because like Curry said yesterday, God hates oppression. Period. He's not the oppressor. He's the deliverer. Okay? So he has not oppressed any, but has restored the debtor his pledge, has spoiled none by violence, has given his bread to the hungry, and has covered the, and, uh, covered the naked with a garment. So many times in Scripture, God talks about feeding the poor taking care of the poor, feeding the needy. That is one of God's hearts. That is the, see, we think spirituality is coming up, I'm not saying here, but because I'm standing what we would call the altar, coming up here, rolling around, getting on your knees, begging God, crying, blah, screaming, all that kind of stuff. Can that be true? Absolutely it can be true. Is most of the time, a lot of times a show? Sure it is. You know, just like people falling out in the spirit. Is that real? Can be. It's not, there's not too much mention about it in scripture. But when they did, they fell forward, not backwards. So I was talking to somebody about it yesterday, and it can be real. Absolutely, it can be real. I've seen people, it was like God took their feet out with a bat or something, and they just went out, and they got up, and they were completely changed. You know. Then you get other people who walk up and say, uh, uh, can, can you pray for me? I, I fall down easy. And then they start going to make sure there's a catcher. Yeah. And then sometimes it can be the devil because you go to put your hand on somebody and before you even touch them, they go down and you think, oh, God, 
you know, blasted them in the Holy Spirit sort of thing. No, it could be a devil wanting to get away from me. So you always follow that up. So if that happens, I put one of our team members on and say, you're going to finish this up. Could it be God? Absolutely it could be God. Like Curry was saying yesterday, he had somebody, you know, going forward, back. So can it be God? Absolutely. But we all have discernment. Use that. You know, if people, you know, say that and they come up and they make sure there's a catcher, they, they you know, give you a disclaimer, I fall down easy. Yeah, sometimes you just move on. I'm not into hype. I, I belong to the hype thing for a really long time, right? So, um, where were we? I cover the naked with the garment. So God talks a lot about the poor. So this, what I was getting at is, is that y- you're almost never more spiritual than you are when you're feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the window of the o- win- widows and the orphans. See, people think, wow, I'm going to give money to this man on the, on the side of the road. And, you, you know, there's a lot of people around here asking for money and stuff like that. Is half of it not legitimate? Yeah, probably. Are you supposed to be their judge? No, it says to give to every man who asks. Give to every man who asks. Well, he might use it for drugs and alcohol. Well, how do you know? Why are you his judge? Give to every man who asks. Same thing when you go into a restaurant and you have the server, you know, and you have bad service. Well, I'm going to show them. I'm not going to tip them. Well, you just treated them the same way they treated you. Right? So we're giving them money based off their performance. Are you really happy God doesn't give you money based on your performance? Most of us will be living in the poorhouse. You bless them. You bless them. We had some real awful service the other night at Chili's. She got blessed. We had a lady in uh, Edmonton, I think, at the Chili's there, and she was, she, um, she, it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. And it was really long, and it was just, it was a real thing. And she was so confused that she just started crying and all that. And um, so we all left, and, and, and some of the people we were with actually got a little short with her. Right? You don't do that when you're traveling with me. That does not happen. How do you know what this person's doing? How do you know they didn't just find out their mom's got cancer, they got a baby sick at home or something like that? You know? And, um, so we left, and my wife went went back and, and um, blessed her. Took her by in the corner, gave her gave her some money, and she was crying. Who who does that? Most of them get punished for how they treat you. Thank God we don't get punished for how we act. So you bless them. It's not your money anyway. It's God's money. If you're not hanging on to it. So you bless the people. But we, we want to be their judge. Oh, sure, you, you put your thumb in my soup, you know. And we want to judge them. We would judge the people on the street corners. How do you know? You ever see those videos, like, they, they call them social experiments or whatever? I'm not much of a social media guy, but I've seen some videos where they've done, they've done tests or whatever, and, and they've tested somebody, and they've given them some money, like a $100 bill. And you would, I mean, our autom- people's automatic thought are, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever, and they go through and they buy groceries and they go to other homeless people and they start handing groceries out to their homeless friends. I saw a video one time, they went in, this man went into acting as a homeless person, had a hidden camera on him, went into a, a very prominent pizza restaurant in New York, very well-dressed man, I mean, just all dressed up in this suit and he had some pizza left over. He was done, there was pizza left over, and he walked in there and he said, I'm just really hungry, could you, could you help me? And the guy's like, yeah, get out of here, go get a job, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes outside and he sees a homeless man um, and they, somebody gave him a pizza on purpose. Okay, this is part of the whole experiment. Gave him a pizza and this other homeless guy walks up and he, he's sitting there and he goes, but he wasn't homeless. He said, I'm really hungry. And the homeless guy shared his pizza with him. But the rich dude wouldn't do it. Come on. And we judge these people. Give to every man who asks. Every street corner we pull up on, I'm, I'm saying to my wife, dig, dig out whatever you got. And she's <laughs> rifling through everything or whatever. And, Sometimes you got this and sometimes you don't, whatever. I mean, today it's harder because you don't carry cash anymore, really, right? So, but you give them what you, what you can, you know? And there, I got I to gotta, I gotta do this, but <laughs> there, was a, there was a homeless man in, in, when I was in a, I just met my mom for lunch at a mall in, in our city, and I was sitting in my truck, and I had just taken back bottles. I like taking, pack bo- taking back pop bottles. Because it's, it's, like, it's like free money. You know I, just, I don't know, I just like taking it back. So I took them back and I had $87, right? And I don't really ever carry cash. But I had $87 on me. And there was a knock. I was sitting there letting my truck arm up because it was cold. And there was a knock on my window. And I look over and this is a man named, I know his name now is Gino. And I, I, he's sitting there and he says, uh, I knew what he wanted. I mean, who comes up to you in a parking lot and knocks? Of course, you know, they're not there to give you something. 
So I was talking to him, and he, he, I knew what he wanted. And, and I said, before I give you what you want, do you have any pain in your body? He said, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, and I have neuropathy, head to toe. And I'm in excruciating pain all the time. And I said, you know what, man? I'll give you everything I have. And, but I want to pray for you first. So I laid my, it sit in my truck, I laid my hand on him, and he was completely healed on the spot, even though he was an alcoholic. Completely healed. Took out the 87 bucks, put it in his hand, and it was like he just won a million bucks. He was so happy, and I said, can, can I, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to hug you. He said, okay, so I hugged him, and then he walked away, and he kept looking back, walking, looking back, walking, looking back, walking, looking back. He, said, he yells out, he says, you know, you ever have one of those moments where you wonder if you met a human being or an angel? That's one of those moments. I said, believe me, man, I'm, I'm, I'm as human as you can get in that sense, right? Um, but God healed him and gave him a pocket full of money. That's awesome. Awesome. But if I had held on to my money, I might not even answer the knock on my window. What do you want? Don't bother me. I gave him everything I had. That's the way we have to treat people. Why? Because that's the heart of God. Anyway, total side note there. Uh, but that, that's whole, all the part of helping the poor. Ver, uh, verse 8. He that has not given upon the uh, usury, neither has taken any increase, that has withdrawn his hand from iniquity, and has executed true judgment between man and man, has walked in my statutes, and has kept my judgments, to deal truly, he is just, and he shall surely live, says the Lord God. So this is a man that was a good, was a good guy, right? Did some good things, and God said, he shall surely live. Now, if he beget a son, so now the father has a son. And if he begets a son, that is a robber. Now it's going to give you a list of things that the son didn't do in the sense of good. He did all the bad things. He did the opposite of the father. Okay? If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that does the like of any one of these things, that has not... Um, any of those duties, but even eaten upon the mountains to defile his neighbor's wife, has oppressed the poor and the needy, so he didn't help, but he oppressed them, has spoiled the violence, has not restored the pledge, has lifted up his eyes to the idols, and has, has committed an abomination, has given forth upon usury, has taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live, he has done all these abominations. He shall see an abomination to God is oppressing the poor. That's one of the things on the list there. All right? An abomination, not just a bad thing, an abomination, mistreating the poor. Sodom and Gomorrah, everybody's familiar with Sodom and Gomorrah? It's mostly famous for the homosexuality, right? Do you realize that most of the reason that Sodom and Gomorrah was, was destroyed was because of how they treated their poor? Go back and read it. It's, it's partially that thing. But go back and read about how much it talked about how they treated their poor. Just throwing that out. He's done all these abominations. He shall, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Not the father. Him. Now, lo, so now we have the father who did all the good stuff. We have the son who did the bad stuff. Now that son has another son who does the good stuff. So now we're talking about the grandson. Okay? Now, by all account, the son should have been a good guy yeah. by generational curses. Okay? Why don't we ever talk about generational blessings? The Bible mentions them, but it's always generational curses. Why? Because Christians are always looking for the bad side of God. There's got to be something wrong with him. Even in 1 John, it tells us that there's no darkness in him. He is light and there's no darkness in him. There's got to be something wrong with this guy. He can't be that good. We have no trouble believing that the devil is all bad, but we have trouble believing that God is all good. It's amazing to me. Now, he begets a son. So the, the son should have been a good guy. And according to generational curse teaching, the, the man who wasn't good, the son coming, so the grandson, should now be a bad guy, as, as we're saying. Okay? I don't like good or bad things like that, but he should automatically be part of the bad that his father has done according to generational curse teaching. Now, lo, if he beget a son... That he sees all his father's sins, which he has done, and considers them, and does not such like. So he saw him, and he's like, no, 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 no. I am not going to turn out like this. I am not going to do this. I'm going to make a decision. Why? To break whatever's been going on in my family generationally. It's a choice. 
Every bit of it is a choice. Like I said on Sunday, you don't fall into sin, you enter into sin. You enter into being a product of your environment. We are all 100% a product for our environment at one point in time or another. I could have gone on not telling my kids that I love them, my two boys, 30 and 27 years old. I could have gone on not, not being uh, um, you know, affectionate to them or any of that kind of stuff. Oh, man, I, told them, I taught them how to cry. You know, I taught them how to treat women. I, I loved them. I, I still hold their hands. My youngest son is like 280 pounds and six foot three. He's a giant. He's strong as an ox. And I hold his hand. If we're standing there, I hold his hand. If we're, we're sitting down, I hold his hand. I'll walk across the street holding my kids' hands. It's like, it's like literally holding on to lunch boxes or bricks or something. <laughs> but I love my boys. And I, I, I didn't want to be that thing because I didn't want them growing up like me, feeling rejection. Because rejection makes you do some pretty stupid stuff. It makes you seek out some really stupid things. And then it just adds things to your life. So I chose not to be that way. I could have said it was a generational curse. It was a generational choice. So if there's been stuff going on in your family and lineage, which absolutely happens, for sure, there can be hereditary things, all that kind of stuff, stop it. It stops with you. Don't pass it on to your kids. If, if it's too late and it already has happened, get your kids, teach them the truth of the Word of God so they don't pass it on to their kids. So you're not having to fall into this nonsense. He has not eaten upon the mountains, neither he has lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, has not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has he oppressed any, has not withholden the pledge, neither has he spoiled by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry, just like the grandfather, and has covered the naked with a garment that has taken off his hands from the poor and has not received usury nor increase, has executed my judgment, has walked on them in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of the father. He shall surely live. Mic drop. Done. Tell me again how generational curses exist. They don't. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, so now we're talking about just the father, not the grandfather, spoiled his brother by violence and did that which is not good amongst the people, lo, even he shall surely die in his iniquity. Yet you say, so they were questioning it, why does not the son bear the iniquity of the father? Because that was the belief. That was, that was the thought. Amazingly, that's what's taught now. When the son has done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept my, all my statutes, and hath done them, this is still God speaking, and he shall, he shall surely live. The soul that sins, it shall die. That's twice it says that. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. You cannot get more plain than that. Well, I still believe in generational curses. Then you're denying scripture because it's so clear. And this is Old Testament. This isn't New Covenant stuff. This is Ezekiel. It's amazing to me. And the wickedness, uh, the, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the, see, this is who God is now. But if the wicked will turn away, so even he's done all this stuff, and watch what God says, but if the wicked will turn um, from all his sins and that he's committed and keep all my statutes and do what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. It's a choice. And all his transgressions that he's committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall surely live. In his righteousness. This is, a, this is a guy we're talking about that did a bunch of bad stuff. Now God's saying, in his righteousness, he shall surely live. Why? Because he turned to God. And God makes you righteous. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Come on. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Well, what about hurricanes? What about tornadoes? What about earthquakes? That's God's judgment on the earth. To punish the people. Really? This says, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? It's not God's pleasure or will that the wicked die because then they don't have any time to turn and repent. It's God's will that, that all men come to know the truth. That all men get saved. That's God's will. And if God's wiping everybody off the face of the earth, he's not giving them time to repent. This is who God is. So when you hear all those religious people, wow, you know, even now, well, it's coronavirus. I tell you, 
You know, God's doing something on the earth to get the wicked to repent. Yeah, then why are Christians getting it? And they're to one person. He's got it to do it to everybody else because he's no respecter of persons. If God uses sickness or disease to teach people something, I want to learn something. So I guess I should ask God for a sickness or disease to teach me something. No, but I got the Holy Spirit to teach me something. He'll lead and guide me into all truth. And he shall live. Have any pleasure in the wicked should die. Say the Lord God. And he should not return from his ways and live. Okay? We're going to end right there. Uh, we'll pick this back up in a couple of minutes. We're almost finished this section. Oh, look at these. I have thanks. I've been wanting these. Oh. Okay. I guess I'm, I'm doing this. Acknowledging what's in you. Fantastic little book. It's, it's a book of confessions. So you say these over your... I know people that read this every single day. They get up every morning. And one of them says, you do it? Yeah? All right. You back there? Okay. Oh, you take it? Oh. Yeah, Curry won't care if I give these away. He's not here anyway. He might be watching, though. I'm not sure. <laughs> I will lay down my life. I will lay down my rights. I give myself to be used for and by God in every situation. So it's a confession. And you can strengthen these by saying, I will lay down my life. And then you can say, I will lay down my life. So you, you get, you, that's how you get the word in you. When God said get, to me, get the word in you, that's what he meant. Not just in here, but in here. So it comes out of here. You want it? You put up your hand first, so. Keep a, keep a running tab on this. Okay. <laughs> Healing 101. These are, these are good little books because you can, you can, you know what I mean? So uh, you want to get it in you so when you go to meet somebody and you're like, oh, you need healing. Just, just like. <laughs> and when they had come to a multitude, the manager said, I can help you. <laughs> this says I can help you. You want to get it in you so you can help somebody, right? So this is a good little book. You are second, so you can have this one. You do? Anybody want this one? I got my cheering squad over there. Okay. Somebody had asked a question that I left for, for Brother Curry that talked about how to release your spirit into your flesh. 